Welcome to another message on the greatness of the kingdom of God. Our textbook is The Greatness of the Kingdom by Alva J. McLean. We're on page 442. We're studying the mediatorial kingdom in the apocalypse. The mediatorial kingdom in the apocalypse. In other words, the book of Revelation. There's a quotation here from George N.H. Peters in the theocratic kingdom. That he, there are three volumes set that he wrote. And by the way, please excuse the horse collar around my neck. Uh, it's very hard for me to... Uh, to stand up here and read for any length of time because of my neck. Chapter 26. It is only through this doctrine of the kingdom that the apocalypse can or will be understood and consistently interpreted. The reason for this lies in the simple fact that it announces the coming, uh, the coming and the events connected with the advent of the theocratic king. Now to enter fully into its spirit and appreciate its force to form an adequate conception of the testimony of Jesus either as a whole or in its several aspects, there must be a necessity to be a precious acquaintance with the covenants and the correct apprehension of the burden of the prophecy based upon the covenants resolving itself into the promised kingdom. There is a promised kingdom. I preached the message earlier this evening on the Old Testament prophecies of the kingdom. We went to Genesis 3.15. We went to Genesis 9 where that, uh, that uh, Japheth would dwell in the tents and the administration of Sham where they'd take over the kingdom. We went to Deuteronomy. We studied where the end times uh, where Israel would be uh, in great tribulation. This was Moses' writings. We went to the book of Daniel. We went to the book of Jeremiah. We went to the Psalms. The last book in the Bible is the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse of Jesus Christ, the, the Apocalypse of Jesus Christ. The last book of the Bible is preeminently the book of the kingdom of God in conflict with and victory over the kingdoms of this world. With this general... Viewpoint, most commentators would agree, regardless of differences over the principles and details of interpretation. It is supported, closely supported, by the terminology of the book. The word thronos occurs 41 times, of which 38 refer to the divine kingdom, 1 and 4, 3 to the satanic kingdom, 1610, our seat. The kingdom Bosleia is found seven times, referring three times to God's kingdom. Revelation 1 and 9, and four times the kingdom of evil, 16.10. The term crown occurs 11 times, three references representing the diadema applied to Christ, 9.12, and to Satan, 12 and 3, and to the beast, 13 and 1. And in eight references, this representing Stephanos, which means crown also. Diadema means a crown won by conquest. Stephanos is usually one awarded by birth. Stephanos applied to the Christian believers. 2 and 10. And to the rider on the white horse, 6 and 2, which is the, which is the uh, Antichrist, the son of Satan. To the dynamic, demonic host, armies, 9 and 7. To Israel, 12 and 1. To the son of man, 14 and 14. The reign, Basileo, is used seven times always of the divine kingdom, 5 and 10. Power, exousia, and authority to rule occurs 20 times. By the way, exousia means no limits. No limits. No limits. Unlimited power. Unlimited authority to use unlimited power. Twenty times about evenly divided between two opposing kingdoms. 22, 26, and 13, verse 4. The rule, the poimenia, in the same shepherdly government, this is the word shepherd, as in John 10. The uh, <coughs> shepherdly government is is used four times always of Christ's activity, 19 and 15. As terms indicating a supreme function of the government, the, the verb judge, crino, occurs, seven, or occurs eight times, and the noun judgment representing crisis, or crema, six times. Significantly, in every instant applied to the divine government, 610 and 147. The word wrath, semos, 15 and 1, and orge, 6 and 16. 
is used 15 times as indicating the expression of an execution of divine judgment and once in the lower sense of satanic anger, 12 and 2, or 12 and 12. The Apocalypse is also the book of the second coming of Christ. After six verses of introductory material, the main body of the book opens with a glad announcement, Behold, he comes with clouds. Well, every eye shall see him, 1 and 7. And the final word from Christ himself uttered from his present throne of grace in heaven it is the promise, surely I come quickly. To which John responds with the last prayer recorded in the scripture, Even so come Lord Jesus, 22 and verse 20. That the second advent and the kingdom are brought together as the main subject of the last book of scripture will occasion no surprise to those acquainted with divine revelation. For these two great eschatological events are inseparable as a goal of history, as we have already noted, especially in the teaching of Christ himself. The personal and glorious coming of the, of the Messiah will bring in the kingdom. Without such a coming, there can be no messianic kingdom. Between the two prayers, thy kingdom come, six, Matthew 6 and 10, and come, Lord Jesus, Revelation 22 and 20, through, uh, 22 and 20, Therefore, there is little difference as to their great objective, except, except perhaps that the later represents the more mature thought in progress of divine revelation. The revelation of the kingdom and its glorious king in the apocalypse can only be apprehended in close connection with the Old Testament. In close connection with the Old Testament, especially in its prophetic literature, particularly the book of Daniel, Although Apocalypse can name no direct citation from the Old Testament, it is saturated with Old Testament phraseology. I have to agree with him because I know Hebrew. In Revelation, the ninth chapter, it uses the Hebrew term, Adonai Ha'adonim, which is one of the Jehovah titles. And there it says, in Greek, a king of king and lord of lords. That is absolutely quoted from the Old Testament in several places. A total of 404 verses, West Con and Hort list about 265, which contain Old Testament language and also about 550 references in two Old Testament passages. Nothing is more important for the understanding of our author's mental and literary process than a close study of the use of the Old Testament language. An exposition which leans heavily upon the Old Testament. 444. Especially in its prophetical writing, according to Hergensburg, it's absolutely indispensable to a proper understanding of the revelation. James Orr says its precursor in the Old Testament is the book of Daniel with the symbolic visions and mystical uh, numbers, which it stands in close affinity. It may be laid down as first principle, therefore, that no interpretation of the revelation can be accepted without breaks with the thought of the Old Testament prophets. As I talked a little bit earlier, I just preached the message from the Old Testament, all the Old Testament prophets of Israel, the dispersion of Israel before they even went into the land, the regathering in the land after the Babylonian and Assyrian captivity, and then the dispersion again because of Messi the, the, the rejection of the Messianic kingdom and the Messiah, and then the regathering again where God will give them a new heart. This is all in Old Testament. Let us now approach the book of Revelation from the standpoint of the general eschatological concept of the Old Testament. If the prophets teach anything clear, they teach that the last times there will be come first, a period when God will pour on his judgment on the world as the following of these judgments is messianic kingdom of God will be established on earth and that this kingdom will become universal in scope and be prolonged without end. It will last for 1,000 years and then will be extended forever and ever. Eon, tani, on, tani, on. Or olam as it's in Hebrew. A long period of time that you cannot understand. Olam means to learn to go far as back as you can and then when you get to where you can't understand anymore, that's where it, olam begins. Now, these are precisely the general ideas of the apocalypse. And they are stated in the same sequence passing over for a moment the introductory material dealing with the giver of the revelation and churches which receive it, chapters 1, 2, 3, the book presents three general suspects, subjects. First, a period of divine judgment on the world, chapters 4 through 18. Second, the coming of Christ to establish his kingdom on earth. Now, after chapter 4, we talk about the church is left. The church is no more mentioned. 
And I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to use my chart on the history of the evolution of Christendom and Catholicism and the true churches that come down through this whole period of time, which the seven churches of Asia will represent. Now, why, why we'll do that later. And third, an extension of the reign of Christ into the eternal kingdom of God and the new heavens and the earth, chapters 21 and 2, especially 22, 3 through 5. The clear and exact correspondence between general ideas of the Old Testament prophets and the book of Revelation is also supported by our Lord's final eschatological discourse as recorded in the Gospels. As to the events of the end time, first there is to be a period of unparalleled tribulation in the world. Let me show you on a map where that period of time is. Here we have the church age. This is where the Lord established his church. It's the seashore of Galilee. It would go down to the age, but it would be uh, contested by Satan and all of his forces. The gates of hell would try to be railed against that church. The, Satan himself would, would ins install many false religions in the world, Catholicism being one. And the evolution of Catholicism, we come all the way over here to we come to the rapture period of time, and I can tell you why I believe in the rapture and pre-tribulation rapture, 4, 16, and 17 and I will later. We have uh, the book, we have the tribulation period in the middle of that week. We have Israel believing in God and then being born again as a nation and then God will cause the earth to have cause earthquakes and, and storms and floods to protect them from the world powers that are in existence, which I believe is Islam. All the way to the end of the week, a lot of people are going to die through this period of time. We've got two-thirds of the Jews dying. We've got five out of every six people in the world dying. And then we have the Lord coming back in glory and establishing his kingdom. And then for 1,000 years, Israel is the administrator of that kingdom on earth, and Gentiles are being born and born and born and born. The earth is repopulated. At the end of that time, of course, the, the devil and his angels and all the demon forces are in the bottomless pit, and then they're turned loose again. They go out and gather together all of their forces that are left, Gog and Magog. There's a last great battle. And then the eternal new heaven and new earth and the white throne judgment where it shows all of those that have it rejected Jesus Christ. No man will ever go to hell because of sin. No man ever goes to hell because of sin. They go to hell because of rejection of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ paid for all man's sin. But it's efficacious only to those that believe and respond to the call of God. We have the white throne judgment. We have a new heaven and a new earth, 2 Peter 3, 10 and 2, 13, Revelation 21 and verse 1, and 1 Corinthians 2 and 9. That's what we're talking about here with a little visual aid. The clear and exact correspondence between the general ideas of the Old Testament prophets and the book of Revelation is also supported by our Lord's final eschatological discourse. discourse. Let's go on down where we end up. Unparalleled tribulation in the world. Matthew 24, 21 through 26. Second, this will be followed by immediate, by the glorious second advent of the Messiah, 24, 29, and 30. And he will he establish his kingdom over all nations, Matthew 25, 31 through 34. And third, the judgments of the kingdom will extend into the eternal state, Matthew 25, 41, and 46. <clears throat> it also should be noted here that the apocalypse preserves and further clarifies the same distinction between the mediatorial kingdom of the Messiah and the universal kingdom of God, which we have already observed throughout earlier scriptures. It is the final book. John sees two kingdoms, each preceded by a throne of judgment. From the first of these thrones, four and two, issue the divine judgments, which finally usher in the mediatorial kingdom of Christ on earth for a thousand years, 20 and verse 6. From the second throne of judgment, 20, 11 through 15, issue forth the final judgments which prepare for the universal kingdom in its final form where one eternal throne is that of God and of the Lamb, 22, 3 through 5. These general correspondences running through the scriptures are too evident to be ignored. As too often they have been. On the contrary, they should provide the surest guide guidance to the understanding of the apocalypse. In its revelation of things to come, from this standpoint, the book may be examined under the following outline. Introduction, revelation of future things and its present blessing, 1, 1, 2, 3. The churches to which the revelation was addressed, 1, 4 through 322, and I'm going to go back 
and we're going to look about what happened during these church periods of church time. Each church represents a period of time in church history. Number two, the revelation of the period of pre-kingdom judgments, 4, 1 through 18, 24. Number three, the revelation of the period of the Messianic kingdom, 19, 1 through 2015. The revelation, number four, the revelation of the final universal kingdom of God, 21, 1 through 22, 5. Conclusion, exhortation to the churches in the view of the Lord's coming, 22, 6 through 21. The churches to which the revelation was addressed. Revelation 1, 4 through 3, 22. All then are agreed that these seven epistles, however primarily addressed to these seven churches of Asia, were also written to edification of the universal church in the same way that it is as St. Paul's epistle to the Romans or to Timothy or to St. James to the dispersion. Were written with this intention, the warnings, the incentives, the promises, the consolations, the generally the whole instruction to righteousness in the, these contained are for every one in all time so far as they may meet the general cases of conditions of men with Christ set, and what Christ says to those here addressed. He says to all in similar conditions. Thus far, there can be no question. And this was uh, Richard Chevenal Trench, Archbishop Trench. Now, I don't believe it's talking about the universal church. It's talking about a, a specific church in a period of time. But in the church age, and even today, some things are relevant to us from all of those letters. But they, but they do represent a specific period of time in history. The last letter to the Laodicean church is what church age that we live in today. And it sure is evident. We have a churchy world and a worldly church. Laodicea means people justice. People do what right in their own eyes. The church looks like the world, and the world looks like the church. And you can't tell either one of them apart. The entire book of Revelation, as, as the individual letters of chapters 2 through 3, is addressed to seven churches. John, the seven churches, which are in Asia. Later in the same chapter, the geological, geographical loca locations of these churches uh, are named Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. 1 and 11 thus indicating their literality. Still later, the same churches appear under the symbolism of the seven golden candlesticks which are identified by the divine person in the vision. Thus, the seven candlesticks which you saw are the seven churches. One and twenty. The Greek term used in Revelation to Zechonic, the seven bodies of believers, is ecclesia. Spanish, ecclesia. In German, kirk. In English, church, which should be translated assembly. In the entire book, the term occurs 20, 20 times, always of the seven churches to which the book was addressed. Outside of the first three chapters, which are introductory to the character, and the word is found only once in the closing epilogue, which refers back to the original recipients of the Revelation 22.16. It is strikingly fact, striking fact, that Ecclesia is never used in the main body of the book where the great eschatological events of the end are described, 4.1 through 22.5. Furthermore, the book of Revelation always employs Ecclesia in connection with the churches on earth, never with a body of saved in heaven. It should be noted also that all references to an ecclesia in the apocalypse apply only to local churches. Basically, there is nothing but a local, visible New Testament church, a body of covenanted believers covenanted together to carry out the gospel. The universal idea of the church came in with Protestantism. Catholicism always looked at a physical, visible symbol in Rome of that church. The, the Protestants, in order to get rid of the visible symbol of that church, they began to talk about the universal church scattered all over the world. The church as an institution is a church, but all churches are local, visible New Testament churches. The symbol is not one uh, candelabrum, 
with seven branches, but rather a group of seven separate lampstands in the midst of the Son of Man walks, two and one. There is in this book of Revelation no one true world church on earth. The idea of any historical ecumenism is totally absent. It is true that in chapter 19, the truly saved and present age are represented as a wife at the marriage supper or the marriage of the Lamb, verse 7. But this scene is set in heaven. The wife here is presented as having been perfected in character, 7 and 8. Furthermore, she is not called ecclesia, a term which by the writer, Revelation is always reserved for local churches on earth composed of good and bad. The only genuine example of the ecumenical organization of religion on earth appears in the great harlot of chapter 17. That's that one world universal church that is ruled by the Antichrist himself, which I now believe to be Islam. Islam's end time prophecies and the Bible end time prophecy are identical. What is good in the Bible is bad in the Quran, the Hadiths, and the Sunnahs. What is bad in those is good in the Bible. The beast and the false the beast in the book of Revelation is a bad guy marking all of Satan's uh, people. The beast in the book uh, in the Quran is the good guy helping the Mahdi to kill all the Christians and kill all the Jews and marking all of those that will not believe in Islam with a black face and the others with a mark of the name or the logo or the statement of faith of Islam. There is no God but Allah, and that is an absolute blasphemy with the Bible because there is no God but Jehovah. There is doubtless some symbolic meaning to the number of churches selected by the Spirit of God for descriptions about this good man have differed wildly. But the one thing upon which they seem to generally agree is that seven here speaks of a totally totality of characteristics. In the seven churches we have every kind of church and every kind of member which not only existed on earth in John's generation but also existed throughout all ecclesiastical history. In other words, we have the seven selected local churches as a composite picture of all local churches on earth at any particular time. Now, I don't agree with that. I believe that these churches represent a particular period of time. We'll go on with this. The term ecclesia, down the page a little bit, in Revelation never used in the sense of the one true body of Christ as used elsewhere in the New Testament, Matthew 16, 18, Ephesians 1, 22 through 23. Whether they be found in this number seven and some typical overshadowing of seven successive errors of church history is a matter which I can come to regard to with some reserve. In other words, he doesn't believe what I believe. Number five, it should be observed that all the churches of Revelation 2 and 3 are pictured as living under the sign till he comes. This is during the church age. Three of these warn of judgment in Ephesus. He says, repent and do the first works or else I will come unto you quickly and remove your candlestick. In Pergamos, Ephesus, by the way, means uh, relaxed. The church had become relaxed. Pergamos means twice married. Repent or else I will come unto you quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. 2.16. To Sardis, if there shall not watch, I will come unto you as a thief. Twice our Lord speaks of his coming as a encourage, as a thief. 3 and 3. Twice our Lord speaks of the coming as an encouragement to Thyatira. Thyatira means continual sacrifice. Continual sacrifice. That during that period of time in church history is when the, when the Catholic Church invented the doctrine of transubstantiation, which is a continual sacrifice of Christ. Twice the Lord speaks of his coming as an encouragement to Thyatira. Also, hold fast till I come, 225, and to Philadelphia, behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. In addition to these direct references, our Lord speaks encouragingly to the churches about things associated with his second coming. 2.23, he refers to the day when we give unto every one of you according to your works. The faithful are promised a crown of life. The overcomers is promised authority over the nations to rule them with a rod of iron. 
In 3 and 10, those who are steadfast at the promise of Christ, for I also will keep thee from the hour of trial, and that hour which has come upon the whole world, to try them which dwell upon the earth. And his final word to faithful individuals of the rejected Laodicean church, our Lord offers assurance of a place with him on his throne. This picture of church on earth points unmistakably to the interim between the ascension of Christ and his return to establish his kingdom on earth. Always the regal rewards for the faithful and the messianic throne of Christ are future, never present during the era of the churches on earth. Furthermore, the picture of the career of the churches on earth is utterly incongruous with the theory of messianic kingdom presently established on earth. Let any student read the record in chapters 2 and 3 and so sorry in many respects then compare the conditions there described with the idyllic condition as set forth in the prophets and our Lord in connection with the mediatorial kingdom and by no device of fair interpretation can the two errors be equated, equated as one. The conditions obtaining during the life of the churches in the, on the earth have been aptly summed up by Zeus. Never indeed, and boy these are small words, small type, Never indeed has there been a sowing of God on earth, but it has been oversown by eight, Satan. Our growth on Christ, for Christ, which plantings of wicked one did not mingle with a high hinder. The church is not an exception. Never will, as long as the present dispensation lasts, even in its first and purest periods, as the scriptural accounts attest. It was intermixed with what per pertained not to it. There was Judas among its apostles, Ananias and Simon Magnus among its first converts, Demas and Diotrephes among its first servants. And as long as it continues in this world, Christ will have his Antichrist and the temple of God, its men of sin. He who sets out to find a perfect church in which there are no unworthy elements, no disfigurations, proposes to himself a hopeless search. Go where he will, worship where he may, in any country, in any age, and he will soon find tares among the wheat, sin mixing with all the earthly holiness, self-deceivers, hypocrites, unchristians in every assembly of the saints, Satan insinuating himself into every gathering of the sons of God to present themselves before the Lord. No preaching, however pure, no discipline, however strict and prudent, no watchman, however searching, or faithful can be ever make it different. So universal and persistent in this mixture of good and bad in the church is that in each case the final exhortation to hear the promise of reward are addressed to individual members in every one of the seven epistles. The call is, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes among the churches on earth to which the revelation was addressed, there is not even one which the Lord could address as an ecclesia that overcomes. Smyrna, of course, you know, the suffering church, was the one that Polycarp was a pastor of. There's not much condemnation to that church. If, as generally agreed, the seven churches of the Revelation present symbolically a composite view of the pro professing church on earth in human history, it becomes significant that absolutely no chronology of the period occurs in the, in the picture. And I will deal with this in our next lesson. We're going to stop right there because I'll need to get my church history chart up behind us and we'll go and we'll study these churches as they were. And they will go on there from there. Thank you for listening to this class. It was a shorter class. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Help us to study it. Help us to glorify you. Forgive us for where we fail you. Help cleanse our lives. Help cleanse our minds. Help cleanse our hearts. Help us to be servants of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.